your Bibles this morning, Psalm 112. Psalm 112, we'll read these 10 verses together and take our message. Today's message is titled this, Fix Your Heart. Fix Your Heart. And we'll pray and ask God's blessing. Let's pray. Lord, help us now. Use your word, I ask, to convict us of sin and show us you. Speak to our hearts. Work in our midst, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 112, the Bible says in verse 1, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Under the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. He hath dispersed, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. So what the Bible says in verse number 7. The Bible says, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Today's message is fix your heart. The Bible says his heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. I like the word fixed. How many of you have ever fixed something? How many of you have ever been really thankful when something got fixed? And uh, I, I'm with you. Fixed. I like the word fixed. And sometimes we have the idea about the word fixed and it's just like we, it's repaired. But the word fixed has a meaning that is quite simple but very important. The word fixed literally means to attach to tightly, to make stable, to set or establish immovable. And we're to fix our hearts on the Lord. And... Uh, it's a fact that oftentimes in life, life sends us things that causes our hearts to get loosely attached to God, our faith in God, the rock which is our salvation, the Lord Jesus. But God says we should fix our hearts. That means we should tighten down the bolts. We should attach ourselves firmly to the faithfulness of God. Fix your heart. Fix your heart. I've got... It's that time of year I've been bush hogging a little bit. I don't have a lot to do, but I've got a little bush hogging to do. And I got my bush hog out, and, and I had done some work on it and got it going really good. And as I began to bush hog, things were going great, but I noticed that the wobble in my bush hog began to get a little more and more pronounced. I thought, I better stop and figure this out and check it out. And sure enough, you know what happened? The bolts that connect the bush hog to the frame had began to uh, work themselves a little bit loose. As a matter of fact, I got on top of the bush hog and grabbed a hold of one of those big bolts that connects the bush hog frame to the gearbox, and it was hand tight. I said, uh oh, we got a problem. You know what I did? I fixed it. I fixed it. And I fixed it right. I made sure they were tight, extra tight, good and tight. I fixed it the gearbox to the frame of my bush hog. Do you understand what I mean? I fixed it. I made it tight. You know what happened? I turned the PTO back on, started mowing again. No problems. No rattle, no shake, no worries. Because my bush hog gearbox was fixed to the bush hog frame. Now, that's a silly illustration for a very important thing. God calls us, his people, to fix our hearts to Him. Fix your heart to the Lord. What's that mean? That means we need to tie ourselves tight 
to the truth of God's Word, to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to fix ourselves tight to the immovable nature of our loving God, our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. We need to fix ourselves to God because I'll have you know something. When you are attached and firmly connected to the Creator of the universe and a God that loves you, you have stability and hope and peace and joy and contentment that you can only find when you're tied, tight, fixed to the Lord. Fix your heart to the Lord. Let me ask you a question. What are you tied to? I'll just tell you, we all have a tendency to tie ourselves to things that we think we can trust in. We like to tie ourselves to jobs. How many of you ever have this uh, little worry that comes across the back of your mind? You think, man, what would happen if I lost my job? And fear begins to boil up inside of you because you fear that you might lose your job. Now, I'm not telling you that, that you can, you're going to live all of your life with no fear at all. But I will tell you this, that if you're tied to a job and your hope is in a position and a job and a paycheck, I'm telling you, you're tied to something that is quite fickle. I'm thankful for my job. I mean, I've got the best job in the world. I only work one day a week and an hour on Wednesday. I mean, who else has a job like this? If you believe that, you're foolish. But I love my job. I really do. I'm thankful that God has allowed me and called me to be the pastor of the Chihuahua Baptist Church. I'm thankful that I'm able to provide for my family. It's good. But I know something about my job. My job is not absolutely, teetotally secure. I'll tell you, I love the deacons in this church, and I don't feel any threat that they're going to fire me anytime soon. Aren't you glad? But the truth is, there may come a time that I have an accident, and I can't perform the duties of being the pastor of this church, and my job is insecure. My job only lasts as long as I'm able to do my job. So I can't trust in my job. I like it. I enjoy it. I thank God's called me for it. But look, I can't trust in my job. Something happened. I had an accident. I was not able to perform the duties of being the pastor of this church. It wouldn't take long, and I'd encourage you to find somebody that could. I'm sure there's folks out there that could do it and do it better. And that's fine. I can't rest in my job. I can't tie myself to this. I can't fix my heart to my job. If I do, there's going to come a time when I can't do it any longer. And the thing that I fix my heart to is movable and changing and it won't help me. If you find your heart so fixed to a job or a profession or a way to earn a living, maybe, not just maybe, but certainly your heart is fixed to something that can't stand the test of time. Often we fix our hearts to people and that's Good to a certain extent. I remember as a little boy, I had my heart fixed to my mother. I remember on many occasions, I'd be, be tired or scared in my bed. And I could call out to my mom, Mom, Mom. My natural reaction in a moment of fear was to call out to my mother. And she'd come in my room and she'd help me. My heart was fixed to her. She helped me. Her presence Help drive away the fear. But there was come a time uh, as a boy that I began to realize that even my mother, as much as she loved me, she was uh, limited in what she could provide and what she could do for me. And I remember having fears as a little boy that, my lands, what happens when I get to be this old and, and mom can't provide that and the things I need? And I, I, I got to think, you don't have these fears as a little boy and a, as a child. What if something happens to my mom? And I remember those fears that came along. And it wasn't long that till the Lord used those fears in my heart. Well, sometimes my mom, how am I, that God began to show himself to me as a child. I put my trust in Jesus. And I tied, I fixed my heart to God. We put our trust in people sometimes. It's easy to do, but I want you to know something. The best of people around you will only last at best a lifetime. But you can fix your heart to the Lord. And God will never change. How do I get stability in my Christian life? I must fix my heart to God. What are you tied to? A job? A hobby? Health and strength? It breaks my heart to watch this happen. But you watch folks 
And as the years go by, you'll testify. If you don't testify yet, you'll testify in due season that the strength that you once had is no longer there. And if you're trusting in strength, let me tell you something, you're trusting in something that's going to fleet away and fail you. What are you tied to? Tied to dreams and ambitions, tied to professions, tied to personality, tied to people, tied to you fill in the blank. And God wants us to know something. Until we've fixed our heart on the immovable character of God Almighty, it's not until then that we can have peace in a tumultuous life and world in which we live. Fix your heart. God's calling us to fix our heart. Fix your heart to the Lord. Tighten the bolts. Lean strongly on Him. Trust in Christ. Trust in the Lord. Fix your heart. How in the world can I fix my heart? There's a few things that come across here in the passage of Scripture that I think will help us to fix our heart to the Lord. How am I going to fix my heart? How am I going to tie myself to the Lord? How am I going to bolt this down and make it tight and snug? How am I going to fix my heart? Number one, if you're going to fix your heart, it begins, number one, with the fear of the Lord. It begins with the fear of the Lord. Look what the Bible says in verse number one. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. Now, now, I love this verse of Scripture. Let's just start with the very beginning. It says, praise ye the Lord. Now, I want you to look at that. Look at it very careful with me. Praise ye the Lord. And then there's a little bit of punctuation right after that. That little dot is called a what? One, two, three? A period. Now, I think you can do better than that. Let's go, class. I mean, school started last week. Some of you have been laying out, I can tell. Praise ye the Lord. Then that little punctuation at the end of that is one, two, three, what a... A period. Now, I want you to hear this. I think this is so good. Praise ye the Lord, period. Period. Now, let me tell you something. We run into obstacles and seasons of life where it is hard to praise the Lord. Have you ever been in a situation where it was really hard to praise the Lord? Let me tell you something. You should praise the Lord anyway. Praise the Lord, period. Now, this is not easy. I promise you that it is not easy, but it is right. You and I have every reason to praise the Lord in our lives. If we begin to ask the Lord to show us reasons to be thankful, He always does. We should be willing to praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but many times I've been down in the dumps. I've been feeling really sorry for myself. My heart's been broken about real legitimate concerns. But God will prompt me to be thankful. To be thankful for Him and thankful for what He's blessed me with. And as I begin to thank the Lord for the things that he brings to my mind that I have reason to be thankful for, what happens is I praise the Lord even in a moment of discouragement and disappointment and sorrow, the more I praise the Lord, the more the burdens of life are lifted. It's not some medicine that just covers up the trouble. It's something that gives us light in the midst of the trouble and the darkness. We should praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, period. When's the last time you thanked God? For the air you breathe, the water you drink, the food you eat. You thank God for the people that you do have around you. You thank God for the moments that you do have, the things that you do have. Instead of worrying and complaining and crying and fretting over the things that have seemingly been robbed from you. God says, praise the Lord. And all through the Psalms, David dealing with some of the most horrendous situations in family and kingdom and life, he reminds us over and over again, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord anyway. What have I to be thankful for? You have life. You have an opportunity to change things. What do you have to be thankful for? You have a little bit of health and strength. You have people around you. You have an opportunity and when all else in the world seems to fail, I want to remind you of something, that God is love and God loves you and God is working and moving in your life. And though you don't understand all the circumstances, you can trust Him. Praise the Lord, period. Praise the Lord. It's not foolhearted to praise the Lord. It is the most wise thing you can ever do is to thank God. 
Because you don't have to look far to find something to be thankful for. If you can't find praise to the Lord in your heart, it's because your heart is so far removed. It is not fixed to the Lord. And God says fix your heart. Praise the Lord, period. The verse continues to verse number 1. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. Now, how many of you find this phrase a little ironic like me? Blessed. The word blessed, it literally means happy. Blessed. Complete. Satisfied. Happy. Blessed. Now, the Bible says, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. How many of you often use the word blessed, happy, and fear in the exact same context. Now, when I'm thinking about happy, fear is nowhere close. I don't know about you, but when I'm scared of something, that's not happy. But the Bible says a happy man fears the Lord. A blessed man fears God. What in the world does that mean? How can I do that? The Bible teaches us to fear God. Now, I've said this many times, and I'll say it again, because I want you to understand what the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is not that I'm afraid that God will hurt me. The fear of the Lord is the respect that I have for God who loves me, saved me, created me, the fear that I might hurt him. We fear the Lord. We respect the Lord. We reverentially have all for the Lord. The Bible says we have to fear the Lord. Now, I'll tell you, when you fear God... Do you know what the byproduct of fearing God is? You're not afraid of all the other little things that may come along and come down the pike. You see, when you fear God, it is the fear that casts away all lesser fears. You fear God, and you don't have to fear losing your job because you know that God who loves you is going to take care of those details. If you fear God, you don't have to fear uh, the you don't have to fear losing folks and losing this and losing that because you know that God is going to meet you with his grace and his mercy and his love. But let me tell you something. If you don't fear God and if your heart is fixed to something other than the unchangeable nature of God, I'll just tell you, when things happen, your whole world falls to a thousand pieces. You have no grace, you have no peace, you have no rest because your heart is fixed to something that is movable. For some reason in my mind comes the picture, the Bible picture of the person who's tied to a millstone and the millstone is cast in the sea I, I know that text but what the, the mental picture that I have is the person tied to the millstone and the millstone cast in the sea and the person going ah, right to the bottom of the drink and the bottom line is if you're tied to something that will sink <laughs> something that will fail something that won't last forever tied to something Like that, the destiny of your demeanor, that your spirit, your outlook on life is tied to something that cannot meet the needs of your heart. And God says, fix your heart on me. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. You see, when we put God first, we know that God rules and overrules and works in our lives. We trust him. Fear the Lord. If you're going to fix your heart, you need to fear the Lord. The Bible continues in verse 1. The Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. The next thing I want to talk to you about is, number one, we fear the Lord. Number two, we follow the Lord. How do we fix our heart? Uh, we fix our heart to the Lord by fearing the Lord. Number two, by following the Lord. The Bible says that a man that uh, greatly uh, delights in his commandments. So we want to obey the Lord. Here's what the, the Bible says in verse number four. How do I follow the Lord? The Bible says, Under the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion. And righteous. How do I follow the Lord? The Bible says here, He is gracious. A person that follows the Lord is gracious. 
I'll tell you, you're not following the Lord when you are nasty. Have you ever been around somebody nasty? How many of you have ever been around somebody nasty? How many of you have ever been the person that somebody was around and you were the one that was being nasty? I've been there, done that. None of you else will admit to it, but here I am. I've been the nasty one. The Bible says, he is gracious. How can I follow the Lord? I'll tell you, following the Lord begins with graciousness. He is gracious. Are you gracious? Grace is a fascinating word. I love the words mercy and grace. Now, God is merciful and gracious to us. He's merciful. His mercy is when we don't get what we do deserve. You've heard me talk about this before. His mercy. When we don't get what we do deserve. I'm thankful for the mercy of God. The Bible says it's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. What do I deserve? Punishment. Judgment. What do I get? Mercy. God doesn't give me what I do deserve. Grace is when I do get what I don't deserve. Now, God extends his grace to me. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So God in grace gives me what I don't deserve. He gives me another chance. He gives me another opportunity. He gives me forgiveness. He offers me patience. And the Bible says, just as God issues graciousness to us, we are to issue graciousness to other people. Gracious. We need graciousness. Folks, as long as you deal with folks, you're going to have to be an issuer of grace. You know what we tend to do? We get so upset People don't do what we think they ought to do. People don't say what we think they ought to. People don't uh, respond the way we think they ought to. People don't, I mean, people disappoint you, won't they? Have you ever been disappointed by somebody? Yeah. How do you think you've ever disappointed somebody? The bottom line is the answer is yes. If you have relationships with people, you're going to deal with People disappointing you. It breaks my heart when I disappoint people. But the bottom line is I know that I do all the time. Not on purpose. But I know that I do all the time. There's moments in my life where that really gets on my last nerve and drives me nuts. And you know what I need? I need God's people to be gracious to me. And I'm thankful that they are you know what people need from me? They need me to be gracious to them. No doubt, over the course of a week's time, there's folks who do things that I wish they didn't and don't do things that I wish they did. And I can write them off when they disappoint me. But that would be wrong. We're to be gracious. You see, when you fix your heart to God, God gives you a gracious spirit towards other people. I think most of... The burdens and problems that we bear in our lives is a failure to be gracious with other people. And when we're not gracious with other people, we're paranoid because we think other people are treating us the way we're treating other people. Does that make sense? See, when you're not gracious with somebody, you get paranoid thinking that everybody else on the planet is treating you or responding to you the way you're responding to them. And so if you develop a gracious spirit in your own heart, before long you begin to think, even if it's in error, before long you even give people the benefit of the doubt that they may be being gracious back to you. The Bible does say, do unto others, you'd have them do unto you. We should be gracious. We should forgive folks. We should be patient with people. We shouldn't write somebody off when they make one mistake or even 50. Gracious. Gracious. A gracious spirit makes a happy home. A gracious spirit makes a happy church. A gracious spirit is a spirit that is the result of a heart that's fixed to God. We should follow the Lord. He's gracious. Look what else it says in verse number 4. Unto the upright there rises light and darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion. Oh, I love the word compassion. We're to be compassionate to people. Compassion is where you attempt to the best of your ability to understand what somebody else is going through. 
compassion. Somebody you say, I have to consider what they've been through. I have to consider where they are. I have to be compassionate to their actions. The way they're acting is the byproduct of their circumstance. And we're compassion. Compassionate, I should say. Compassion. Some of the most compassionate people you ever meet are people who've been through great difficulty. I'm thankful for compassionate people. Some of the least compassionate people you've ever been through are people who seemingly had everything their way or feel like they have earned their way. We should be compassionate people. The Bible says that compassion is what makes a difference in the people around you for the matter of their salvation. Compassion matters. Compassion is what we need. Compassion. If you're more tempted to be the person who says they made their bed, let them sleep in it, instead of maybe we should give them another chance. Perhaps compassion is something that you need. Compassion. You see, when we follow the Lord, we're gracious. We're full of compassion. Look, don't get so hung up with your world the way it is. Your little bubble, your little soft spot, your little comfortable place. That you're not willing to offer and extend compassion to somebody that may not look like you, smell like you, act like you. Compassion. God calls to be compassion. When you fix your heart to the Lord, you're going to be gracious, full of compassion. Look what it says in verse 4. The last word, and righteous. I like this word righteous. Now this doesn't mean that when you have your heart in tune with God, you're never going to mess up ever again. But I will tell you this, when your heart is fixed to God, you're going to find out that righteousness becomes important. You're going to say no to sin and say yes to what's right. Righteousness. Let me talk to you just a minute about sin. Our society is doing its dead level best to get away rid of the idea that people have sin. Look, we all are sinners. Now, doctors, and I'm not criticizing all doctors because they're not all there, but all here, but there are folks who are trying their dead level best to excuse sinful behavior as some type of birth defect, some type of genetic mutation, some type of situation where you were born with this proclivity to sin. And I would say to that doctor, you're correct, but I was born with a proclivity to sin because it started in my father Adam in the Garden of Eden when he returned against God. And every person that's ever been born is a sinner. We have a sin nature. It's not Something that must be medicated away. It's not something that should be excused as they can't help it. It's the mental state in which they are and they were born. And by default of DNA, they've developed this. It's sin. And God, as we put our trust in Him and Fix our hearts to him. He gives us the ability to get victory over sin. Don't excuse your sin. Don't just sin because you say, that's just how I am. Don't excuse your sin. You need to determine with God's help to live a righteous life. Say no to sin. Forsake the sin. Repent of the sin. Turn from God. Turn from the sin and turn to God. We're to follow the Lord. Righteous, following the Lord. He is gracious, full of compassion. He's righteous. Verse number 5. A good man showeth favor. I like that word favor. A good man showeth favor. A good man is willing to make friends. A good man is willing to like somebody else. You may be one of these people that don't like people. Sometimes I joke, and as I promise it's a joke. I say something like this. You know, the ministry would be easy if it wasn't for people. <laughs> I don't even like people, but I do. But you get in your heart as a child of God, you're here and you're saved. And you get to the place where you don't like people, you don't want to be around people. Let me tell you something. That's a testimony of the fact that your heart is not fixed to the Lord. You see, one of the things that is a testimony to the fact that our hearts are in tune with God is He gives us a love for other people. When my heart's in tune with God, I love people. When my heart is cold and I'm selfish, I don't love people. The Bible says a good man showeth 
favor. Show a favor. Man, I really love him. Oh, I've watched this so many times play out in my own heart. You'll have these moments where you love and then moments where you don't. Moments where you love and moments where you don't. And those are always a testimony to the nearness of my heart, to my God. My willingness to be humble before the Lord. The Bible says that as we follow the Lord, we fix our heart to God. A good man showeth favor. Look at the next verse. And lendeth. And lendeth. The Bible teaches that we're to be gen- generous and lendeth. We're to, we're to share. I've talked about my neighbor in Fletcher a few times, and he was always so generous to help me out. I remember I was remodeling the house we were living in, and I was in the bathroom floor on my hands and knees uh, fixing a shower or something. I was remodeling a bathroom, and I remember being there. I'd not met Mr. Eddie yet, and Mr. Eddie comes in the bathroom. He loved to talk, and uh, Mr. Eddie comes in, in the bathroom where I'm working, and he's like, now I want you to know something, preacher. I have got a shop completely full of tools, and he says, you're welcome to use anything I've got anytime you want it. He said, God gave me them, and really, as far as I can tell, they're not mine anyway. I just have to, I just get to use them for a while. So if you want to use them while I've got them, that'd be great. And it's one of those things I'm like, well, thank you. But I could tell pretty soon that he, was, he meant it because he gave me a key to his shop, and he was all the time helping me and sharing. And I was thankful for that. He lended. Now, I'm not telling you that you need to lend without caution. Look what the next phrase is. I think this is so fun. A good man show a favor and lendeth, verse number 5. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Now, when we're showing favor and we're lending, we have to be wise about it. I remember when I was a little boy, I was about six years old, and uh, it was really the moment when weed eaters were first becoming uh, popular. And I was fascinated that Mr. Jones, my papa Bice's, Bill Bice's neighbor, had gotten a weed eater. It was not just any weed eater. It was one of them weed eater brand weed eaters. It was green. You remember that? And you carried the motor in your hand. It had a crooked shaft. And I remember, I was just a little boy, and I remember him watching him weed eat. I was like, that thing is awesome. I was like, oh, man, I would just, I was six years old. I was like, I'd kill for the opportunity to use that thing. That would be awesome. And I remember uh, there was a bank there at my papa's house, and he didn't have a weed eater. And I thought, man, I think I could help my papa out if I go and borrow Mr. Jones's weed eater to weed eat papa's bank. And so I was like, and I really want to use the weed eater too. So I walked over to Mr. Jones. Now, I was about six years old, kindergarten age. And I walked over, I marched over to Mr. Jones's house. I knocked on the door. I said, Mr. Jones, hey, Cody, what are you doing? He was always so kind to me. I said, can I borrow your weed eater? I want to weed eat Papa's bank for him. And you know what Mr. Jones told me? No. <laughs> you know why? Because he guided his affairs with discretion. He said, I'll tell you what, you may not be quite big enough to run that weed eater, but I'll help you, and maybe we could, me and you could go over there and do that. And he if I remember correctly, he weed eated it for me. And I didn't get to weed eat it. But it wasn't just a few months seemingly later that my grandfather, Dick Sturgill, gave me all the weed eating I could stand. And so, uh, uh, but he exercised, he said, no. Now, here's the point. When your heart is fixed to the Lord, you follow the Lord, you serve other people, you love people, you are, show favor, you give, you're generous. Not haughty selfish, hateful. Fix your heart. When you fix your heart, you fear the Lord. When you fix your heart, you follow the Lord. When you fix your heart, you faith the Lord. You believe and trust the Lord. Do you believe and trust the Lord that He's able to take care of you? Do you believe the Lord that He's able to help you through the deepest, darkest moments of your life? In verse number 2, The Bible says, his seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Now, here's an answer. He says, when you fix your heart, when you tighten, bolt yourself, tie yourself to the Lord, he says, it's going to bless your family. This isn't 
a promise that always comes true 90, 110% of the time. There are times when faithful people, their children don't turn out right. But the Bible teaches as a principle that we can trust in that the vast majority of the time when parents live godly lives and point their children to the Lord for the greatest portion of the time, the turnout is good. His seed will be mighty. Some people excuse their faithlessness. They excuse their unwillingness to be part of the body of Christ. They turn their backs on God because it, I can't right now. I can't do that to my kids. Oh, man, you need to point your children to the Lord. Trust the Lord with your children. Trust the Lord, in verse number 3, with your wealth and riches and your eternity. Trust the Lord. Look at verse number 4. Under the upright, there riseth light in the darkness. You can trust the Lord even when it's dark. I'm not talking about dark outside, but the moment that you live in is dark. How many of you are living in a dark? You don't have to raise your hand. You're living in a dark moment. You think, oh, man, this is rough. Let me tell you something. If you'll keep your eyes on the Lord, you'll find out that God, as you trust him, you live for him. As you tie your heart, fix your heart to the Lord. You're going to find out that he'll give you light in the midst of darkness. Oh, it's sweet to watch the Lord do what he says he'll do. The Bible says in verse number 9, He hath dispersed, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness endureth forever. Look at this last phrase. His horn shall be exalted with honor. His horn shall be exalted with honor. Some people are scared to stand up. And live for Jesus because they're afraid that their reputation is going to be marred because of it. That word horn, uh, it's an interesting word. It's an uh, Old Testament Bible word that represents your reputation. It represents your standing with other people. And the Bible says as you put your trust in the Lord, as you fix your heart to God, the Bible says that the Lord will exalt your horn. The Lord will exalt you. The Lord will protect you. The Lord will give you the credibility you yearn for. His horn shall be exalted with honor. In verse number 10, the wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Your foe, your enemy, will fade. As you put your trust in the Lord. What do we do? We're to trust the Lord. Is your heart fixed? What's it fixed on? Maybe it's fixed on some experience. Maybe it's fixed on some profession or some identity. It's fixed on some person. But God says, fix your heart to the Lord. If you find yourself growing cold, fix your heart to God. What's it mean? You need to tighten the screws. You need to torque down the bolts. You need to double knot. Tie your heart to God. Fix your heart to God. If you'll put your trust in Him, you're going to find Him always faithful. God calls us to fix our heart. Fix your heart. Let the Lord have His way. Put Him first. Let's pray.